All right, great. Thank you. Oh, wait, I got to give you a mic. I have a big mouth. They, uh, <laughs> I have. We can do that. There we go. <laughs> Uh, Mom was going to read today, but she's asked me to sub, so we're going to worship through the word with Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. One day, as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute, persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad. For a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember that ancient prophets were persecuted in the exact same way. This is the word of God. Thank you. <laughs> so we have been working our way through the Beatitudes for the last few weeks, right? The Beatitudes, they're found at the very beginning of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which is found at the very beginning of the Gospel of Matthew. This is the first time Jesus teaches in the book of Matthew, and he's just beginning to do life and ministry with his disciples. A few weeks ago, I shared this quote from Dallas Willard. Willard says that the greatest issue facing the world today, with all its heartbreaking needs, is whether those who are identified as Christians will become disciples, students, apprentices, and practitioners of Jesus Christ. Steadily learning from him how to live the life of the kingdom of the heavens into every corner of human existence. You see, this is why we're studying Matthew together. Because our goal, right, is that we become students, apprentices, practitioners of Jesus in Flagler County, in Palm Coast, and in our neighborhoods, in our homes, with our neighbors, in facilities, in schools, all around the world. We want to become practitioners of Jesus, right? So, so how do you become a practitioner of Jesus? Well, you learn from him, right? And how do we learn from him? Through his word, through prayer, through study, through fellowship with one another. And, and that's, what we're, that's what we're doing here. We are working on being fully engaged in the life of and the mission of Jesus to reach our world. And in order to do this, you know, there's no better place to find out about this than in the Gospels. The Gospels are where we can watch how Jesus lived, we can hear what he taught and commanded, and we can see what he valued and what he prioritized. This week we're looking at the sixth beatitude, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. My old church used to have a couple of vans that we would use to take st students home after a youth group and after outings or retreats. We'd, we'd shuffle them around in these vans, and one of the vans was newer and plush. It was really nice, and so it got used all the time. The other van was older and a little more rickety and broken down, so sometimes it would sit for months at a time before we would, we would feel the need to use it. One day, I went out to the old van to jump in it to uh, get it going and to use it. And when I unlocked the door and opened it, the interior was soaking wet. 
Uh, and it was a warm day, so it was kind of musty, right? And then I look, and there is mold everywhere in this van. Every carpet, every seat, all over the headliner. It was, it was disgusting, right? It, it, what was happening was the moisture was mixing with years of youth ministry, right? <laughs> It was mixing with candy wrappers, with French fries, with spilled soda, and, and this van was a living, breathing Petri dish <laughs> of mold. So I closed the door, locked it, and left it for the next person to find. No, I didn't really do that. I'm not a sociopath. Come on. No, I... I got after. We took care of business. I went and I got some soap and water, right, and car wash liquid, and, and I just started washing the outside of the van. I, I you know, armor all the tires. I clean the windows. I, I scrubbed this van, and it was shining. I felt good about it. So then I opened the door, and it was still a mess. I'm like, what in the world? Why, why is it still a mess inside there? No problem, I thought. This van needs some friends. So I threw the van a party. I pulled some other cars over next to the van so it wouldn't be alone. I played some music. I lifted the hoods so they could look underneath the engines, right? I was sure some social interaction for this van would take care of the mess that was inside of it. But when I opened the door again, it was still moldy and gross. Okay. We need some dramatic measures, I said. So I went out and I bought some Mercedes-Benz emblems, and I stuck them on this old Dodge van. Surely a little status is going to go a long way in helping clean up the filth inside this van, right? So I opened the van up again, and now it smelled like death, right? <laughs> Maybe a little pleasure would help this van. I ordered some takeout food. We put on a racy movie with Italian sports cars, and we let the van spend all night taking in all the pleasures of life. But in the morning, the interior was still moldy and mildewed and dirty. You see, you guys understand, we understand how ridiculous this story is, right? Of course, to take care of the issue inside the van, we... We actually had to pull out the seats. We tore the carpeting out. We put a new headliner in it. We, we you know, shop vacked and steam cleaned, and we got after the interior of this van, and, and we, we got it cleaned up eventually. But you had to get on the inside, right? When we struggle with sadness and with depression and with sin in our lives, Sometimes our first instincts as people is to try to shine up the outside, to get new friends, to, to change the people I'm hanging out with, or, or to, to chase status, or to chase pleasure, instead of doing the hard interior work required for real health and healing, real purity of heart and the interior work that, that Jesus is, gonna, is calling us to today as we, as we look at this text. Our tendency as humans is to want to do outside work more than inside work. The religious leaders of the day, when Jesus were alive, was alive, were all about outside work. They pulled out 613 laws from the New Testament and worked hard to follow them perfectly, and they demanded that everybody else follow those outside laws too, right? Laws about what you could eat, laws about what you could wear, what you could touch, who you could associate with. The, the list went on and on. Now, God had given them laws in the Torah, right? But what, what these leaders did is they added to those laws. They, they added it and made it even harder to, to follow than what God had given them in his law. So Jesus confronts these leaders with their fixation on exterior looks. Matthew 23, 25, and 28, he says this, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside 
also will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs. You're like old Dodge vans, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Man, Jesus, <laughs> he's taking it to him, right? He's taking it to him. It's harsh. Fixation with external images. And he elevates the idea of internal purity, purity of heart. Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart. But what exactly does that mean? And how do we get there? In Hebrews, uh, in Hebrew, the, the idea of, a, of the heart carries with it the idea of a person's core, their center. It, the heart in, in Hebrew, in Hebrew t- thinking and, and philosophy, is the home of personal feelings, of, of willing things, of thinking, of emotions. Heart, will, mind, and emotions are all covered in Scripture by the term heart. So pure in heart is basically saying that a person is congruent, they're centered, they're focused, they're single-minded on Soren Kierkegaard, he's a Danish philosopher who lived in the 1800s. He was a follower of Jesus, and he wrote a book called Purity of Heart is to Will One Thing. Purity of heart is to will one thing. Purity of heart is to want one thing. Purity of heart is to look at one thing, right? That's what Kierkegaard said purity of heart was. That that basically a pure heart is a heart that's laser focused on God, that sees the world with all its beauty, with all its hardships, through the lens of God. It recognizes that God is the center of everything, working, moving, forming, shaping everything. Here's a quote from his introduction of the book. Kierkegaard says, Father in heaven, what is a man without thee? What is all that he knows, vast accumulation though it be, but a chipped fragment if he does not know thee? What is all his striving Even if it filled the world, it would be but a half-finished work if he does not know thee, thee the one who art one thing and who art all. I mean, Kierkegaard, this is a brilliant, right, philosopher. And what's he say? Fix your eyes on one thing. Fix them on God in heaven. It doesn't matter if you launch a SpaceX rocket to freaking Mars. It's nothing if you don't know the one thing. It's nothing. Paul expresses a similar thought in the book of Philippians. You know, Paul was a Hebrew of Hebrews, right? He, was, he, he came from a pedigree of, of, of Hebrew thinking and thought. He was genius, And he says in in Philippians 3, 7 through 11, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. And then, then Paul kind of loses himself while he's writing here, and, and he almost gets poetic. I think it's so beautiful. All of a sudden he says, I want to know Christ. Yes, and to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. A pure heart is a heart that places God at the center of the universe, and for us here today, more importantly, places God at the center of our own lives. Now, now I don't know about you guys, but this is convicting to me. 
I find this really convicting. If I'm honest, I pretty much have myself at the center of my life. Of my thinking, at the center of my willing. If you guys see into my heart, <laughs> see what's actually occupying it, there'd probably be this little mini me running around in there, demanding my way. It'd be distracted by many shiny things all around it. That's what my heart's like. It's hard not to live this way. The world reinforces the idea of living for yourself. You hear people say all the time, well, you have to look out for number one, right? When we are struggling and, and we go to people for advice or help, many times the first thing we're going to hear is, well, you just got to follow your heart, man. That's terrible advice. If you knew my heart, you would not tell me to follow it. <laughs> Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and it's beyond cure. Who can understand it? Matthew 15, 19 through 20, Jesus says, For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. Don't follow my heart. Don't follow your heart. Turn our gaze and our focus onto Jesus. Onto God the Father. And when He becomes so beautiful to us, something amazing happens to our heart. It begins to be transformed, it begins to be made new. Our heart of stone becomes a heart of flesh, and we become pure in heart through the work of Christ. Not the work that we do, right? Because we can't do the work. But Jesus can do the work for us. Russian novelist Ivan Turgenev has this quote. He says, I don't know what the heart of a bad man is like, but I know what the heart of a good man is like, and it's terrible. <laughs> Jesus' idea of a pure heart is a heart that wills one thing, that is singular in focus, and it's not full of mixed loyalties and affections. So this leaves us asking a couple of important questions. First, is my heart pure? And second, do I know anything about single-hearted devotion to God? Well, in regards to is my heart pure, the first question we all know the answer, no, it's not. We are all a mixed bag. You know, one minute I'm up here preaching because I want God glorified, and then I start walking out and somebody says, hey, nice job on the sermon, and all of a sudden I'm like, yeah, it wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> you know, we're, we're a mixed bag of motives, all of us are. But thanks be to God, through Jesus, we can be made new. Jesus calls us to an unobtainable standard, purity of heart. He calls us to an unobtainable standard. But he gives us a God-sized solution. He gives us a God-sized solution. 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. Listen to this. By his wounds, you have been healed. By his wounds, you've been healed. This thought stops me in my tracks. My broken, impure, rebellious heart is healed because of Jesus' wounds so that I might die to sin and I might live for righteousness, so that my heart might be pure. He himself bore our sins. It's amazing. It's beautiful. What Jesus has done for me turns my affections and my heart away from being self-focused, and it redirects my affections and my heart towards him. It wells up in joy and thanksgiving so that what he has done for me turns my face and my gaze towards him. 
what he has done for me takes my eyes off of myself and they plant it firmly on him. And I'm single-minded, single-focused. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for me. When we grasp this, we can't help but to take our eyes off of ourselves and to gain intently at God. Blessed are the pure in heart, it says, for they will see God. We see him when we see what he's done for us. Our salvation, our healing, and our restoration has the power to purify our hearts. And when our hearts are pure, we are promised something. We will see God. Followers of Jesus see God now. Not in, total, not in totality, but we see glimpses of him, right? In sunrises, in sunsets, in the power of the oceans, in the beauty of the scriptures as we meditate on his word, we see God. In new life at birth, we see God. In our spouse's love, we see God. In our neighbors, in our friendships, in our testimonies of transformation for what God has done for us, we see God when we see him moving and active in, in all these ways and in many other ways. The psalmist saw God moving and active in the world. Psalm 46, 8 says, Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow. He shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Seeing God is a powerful and it's a beautiful thing, and it's a transforming thing. It changes us when we see him. We can't be the same after seeing him. Moses, we know this about Moses, right? Exodus 33, 11, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to camp, but his young age, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. So, so God is speaking with Moses face to face. And, and what happens to Moses during that time? Can, do you know what happens? What? Shekinah glory, Right? His face shines because he's been in the presence of God. Listen to, to Exodus 34, 34 through 35. But whenever he, Moses, entered the Lord's presence to speak to him, he would remove this veil from his face until he had to leave the tent. Then when he left the tent, he put the veil back over his face because his shining face freaked out all of Israel. Right? Right? It freaked Israel out. So he would put a veil back over his face so he didn't freak the people out. But then he'd go meet with God again and he'd be like, <laughs> give it to me, right? Verse 35, they saw his face was radiant. And then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord again. When Moses would see God face to face, his face would become radiant. Seeing God changes us, right? But I've seen people's faces become radiant. I don't know about you. I've seen people beam with life after meeting Jesus, after seeing him in profound and meaningful ways. Not only does seeing Jesus have the power to change our countenance, but it changes our hearts. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 through 18, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. freedom. And we all, you and I, with unveiled faces, right, contemplate, think about the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We see God and it changes us. It changes us. It purifies us. Last week, Stacy talked about this mercy loop, right? 
where we see our need for mercy, we receive mercy, and then we offer mercy to others only to recognize our need for more mercy, then receive more mercy, and then become more merciful to the world around us. The same thing happens with purity. The same thing happens with purity, church. The more pure we become, the more we recognize our need for purity, and and the more God transforms us and makes us pure, which shows shows us our sin all over again, and and it's a purity loop. Seeing God makes you not want to stay where you are. Seeing Him for who He is is so beautiful that it transforms our hearts, our minds, our passions, our desires. He becomes the most beautiful thing in the world, and all the rest of that stuff, like the Apostle Paul, becomes garbage compared to the beauty of seeing him. The purity loop. Ever-increasing glory again and again and again. We do not stay the same as we look at Jesus. Our gaze is fixed on him. He purifies us with ever-increasing glory, making us his righteous sons and daughters. 1 John 3, 2 through 3, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. You think it's good now? You have no idea. But we know that when Christ appears, okay, this is nuts. This is crazy. We know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. When we see Jesus, he's going to completely transform us and we're going to be like him. Now, we don't see him fully yet, right? And we're all in process. And we are all moving along, you know. And he is patient and loving with us. And he doesn't give us more than we can handle, right? Sometimes it takes years for us to get past something that we know we need to get past. But he loves us. And he is patient with us. And he walks with us. So I don't know where you guys are at. I don't know if you're holding on to something today that you're so sick of holding on to. But I want you to know that after we do communion, the the prayer stations are open. And if you want to go to God and ask him to do something new and fresh in your life, you head up to one of these prayer stations and somebody will pray with you and you can give it to Jesus. He wants to meet you where you are. He doesn't want you carrying around that old, dirty, gnarly heart. He wants to give you new life, freedom, freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. So church, let's be a people who are honest about the condition of our hearts. Are they pure? Are they single-minded in our focus on God? Or are they focused on many shiny, distracted things? Let's acknowledge our need for God to do the work for us that we can't do on our own, right? Let's invite him to purify us again. Let's invite his activity anew in our life. Let's resist the urge to focus our attention on the outward, external righteousness that the Pharisees focused on. And let's commit our hearts to internal purity and love for God and and this world. And we know how that happened. We know it happened because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, right? 